Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Clinical and Translational Science Research Bootcamp. Um, today's presentation will be getting started with the retrospective research presented by Dr. Alex Schillenberg. Alex is a graduate of the WVU School of Pharmacy and completed her postgraduate oncology residencies at WVU Medicine. She currently practices as a specialist with hematologic malignancy at the WVU Cancer Institute, but will be relocating next month to the Levin Cancer Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina as a stem cell transplant specialty pharmacist there. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I put the part in there about me relocating in case you have any questions and you try to find me. I don't know how much longer I'll have access to my WVU email address, so um, you can probably get forwarded it along, but if you have any questions, let me know. So a little bit um, just about me and as far as why I am here talking to you about retrospective research as a pharmacist. Um, I've been very involved with our pharmacy research projects that we do. So as a resident, we complete two projects, one of them usually retrospective, the other one can be either retrospective or prospective each year. Um, so in the span of one year, we do two projects. So I did four projects in two years. Um, and since then, I got pretty involved with mentoring our residents and students. So I've had either a pharmacy resident or student doing a project with me every year since. Um, actually, my first year in practice, I had three residents doing their projects with me. Um, so I've gotten pretty good at critiquing some of these retrospective, do it in a quick time span type of projects. So just a couple of terms for you. So the term MUE or DUE is often associated with retrospective chart reviews. So a medication use evaluation, a drug utilization evaluation. Um, those are also retrospective chart review type projects, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, the topics that I want to go through, I have three basic topics. First, I want to cover approvals, the big scary approvals section. So if you are venturing into research for the first time, usually you start with a retrospective project, um, and the scariest part is what do you have to do to get it approved. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll go through a little bit of project design, how to design your project for, and set yourself up for success, and then some of your resources here at WVU that you can use to get your data. So we'll start with approvals. So the first thing is, of course, the Institutional Review Board. So if you're not familiar with this topic, Institutional Review Boards are owned by the institution. So at here we have the WVU Healthcare, WVU Medicine, IRB. Um, it's associated with each individual institution. So if you're doing a multi-center project, you typically have to get IRB approval at each center. Um, they are regulated, however, by a committee that is national. So they have certain standards that they have to have. Um, they typically have to have a minimum of so many scientists, a minimum of so many clinicians, and also community members. So there has to be a non-medical person there looking for that as well. Um, so their goal is to look at all research involving humans, and they want to look and make sure that everything is safe and appropriate and managed in an appropriate way. So that's one, of, one introduction to IRB. So do you need IRB approval? for your project? Well, that depends for a retrospective chart review on the intent of your data. So as employees of WVU or West Virginia University schools or at the hospital, you often have access to that data as part of your daily job. So can you collect that and report on that without an IRB approval? Um, it's based on that intent. So if I want to use that data to improve processes and operations internally, I work in the cancer center and I see something that I'm not quite sure um, we're up to national guidelines or standards on, so I'm going to look at it over the last two years and summarize that data. I'm going to take that data and I'm going to implement a process to help improve care for our patients. No, I don't need IRB approval. I'm an employee here, I'm doing something for the patients. Same thing here, if I'm enhancing patient care at the institution, no, I don't need an IRB approval to work within the context of my job. Um, even in a retrospective review type of project. If I intend to publish this data, even completely de-identified aggregate form data, if I'm publishing it at all, you need to get IRB approval. Um, if you intend to contribute to the general knowledge of the public via a poster, a meeting presentation, um, a newsletter publication, anything that leaves the walls of this institution, yes, you need IRB approval. So that's kind of the general way to break that down. If you start looking into something and you meant to do it for a performance improvement, but you see that it could be really impactful and publishable, can you do IRB after you've collected the data? 
Technically, you can, but they really don't prefer that. They discourage that. If you think you might possibly present it somewhere, get IRB approval on the front end. They'll be more friendly to you, I promise. All right, so IRB review comes in three levels. When you're doing a retrospective chart review, you don't go for full board review. Full board reviews are protocols that are typically interventional. They're looking at new treatment combinations or even drugs that aren't approved or processes or um, therapeutic interventions that aren't standard of care. When you're doing a retrospective chart review, you're not actually changing any actual care of the patient. Um, so you typically would go for expedited or exempt. Exempt is the easiest way to go, but most retrospective chart reviews will actually fall under expedited, and I will show you why. Um, so first, let's define something before I go too far, because they talk about minimal risk. Um, so minimal risk is a federal definition, and it basically means that your risk of harm to the patient um, is less than they would encounter in just coming to the institution for a regular visit. Um, so that means protection of their health information and their data, and that means you can't do anything to them that wouldn't normally be done if your study did not exist. Even if it's already a lab draw, they already get their labs drawn and they get a CBC for their disease state every week. But you wanna add on a magnesium to that. That's something that's not part of their standard of care. So that does not fall under minimal risk. So exempt categories. Exempt is the easiest review, it's pretty quick. Um, education research falls under here. And education research is not research to provide education, it is research about the educational techniques. So if I want to research how well you're learning and listening to me right now, then that's an exempt review. Um, surveys can be exempt, so the, that type of research. The one that most of my students think that they can apply to theirs is this number four, analysis of previously collected anonymous data. That is anonymous data. So if you're going into a chart and you can see the patient's name and you can record information that from their visit that is personally identifiable to them, that is not qualified here. What that means is if I had a student two years ago who collected a whole bunch of data for a project that's de-identified and did something with it, and now we wanna go back and look at that data and maybe answer a different research question, she can look at that data that's already collected and already de-identified and do a project and that would be exempt. But if she goes back into the chart at all, you have to go for expedited. So the expedited categories are kind of wordy. I'm not going to go through a lot of them. Um, the one that we most likely fall under here is research involving materials that have been collected for non-research purpose. So information that was collected because the patient needed to be here. And so that's what we typically use for a lot of our chart review data. So some tips for getting through IRB. Have a really, ration, a really robust rationale and background. That is, sets the justification for why you're doing your project. Why do you need to look at these patients' personal health information? If there's a reason, and you typically have a reason if you have a project, you need to explain that very clearly to them and say, this is what I'm looking at. This is why I think this will be helpful. These are previous studies that have been done that lead me to think that my question is relevant and could be answered by looking at this data. So put some time and effort into that. Have a detailed plan for data analysis. How are you gonna analyze this? Are you gonna do it all yourself? Do you have a statistician? Do you work with a certain department? Etc. cetera. De-identified information only. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to say that all information will be de-identified. Um, they really wanna hear that. So you're not going to publish any identifiable information. Have a data collection sheet. I know that most of us use an electronic collection, whether you use REDCap, whether you use a program that allows you to enter information, or whether you just use an Excel spreadsheet. That's, I'm a little more old school, that's kind of what I like to do. Um, but have a data collection sheet. Make it in Word, show them exactly what pieces of information you're gonna collect. Why? It makes it very clear to them, these are the pieces you're gonna look at and nothing else is what you're gonna record. And that's what they wanna know. That's their concern, is the protection of the patient's privacy and information. So I had a student who was looking at um, the incidence of hypertension that developed with a drug called Avastin or Bevacizumab. It's common for causing hypertension. So she was evaluating how frequently it developed, how severe it got, and what was done about it. Was it managed normally? Was it not managed at all? And so she had developed this data collection form. And it shows exactly what she has on there um, that she plans to collect and gives her lines to add on to that. Um, so whether you intend to use that, and she did, she used them and put them in a binder, it was easier for her. Um, most of my students, however, do an Excel spreadsheet. I 
say make a data collection sheet, it just shows them very clearly what you're collecting. And have a data management plan. That means think about where the data is going to be stored, who's going to have access to it. Usually you want to say things like only the investigators listed on the protocol will have access to the data, data will be stored securely on an encrypted device, and medical record will only be accessed um, via a secured network such as the one here at the hospital. Um, Remember, their concern is potential leaks of information. So you want to reassure them that you will do everything you can and then, of course, do everything you can to protect that patient's information. Um, it is also a law that you have to keep that information that you stored recorded for three years, at which point if you no longer need it, it needs to be appropriately destroyed. So rationale background, I mentioned this a little bit. So why are you asking this research question? What brought you to develop this project? Um, a comprehensive literature search with appropriate references from peer-reviewed journals typically are what you want to justify the reason for asking your question. And this is kind of how I describe to my students and residents to lay out your background. Make it logical for them. If A plus B plus C equals D, show them that. Um, so this was a project that I had um, a resident do. And so she had data that showed that protein pump or proton pump inhibitors, so like your Prilosex and things like that, will raise gastric pH, meaning make it less acidic, less stomach in the acid. So we had a little bit of data show that that's, that's absolutely what it does. Drugs that are used to treat CML, a type of chronic leukemia, they don't absorb well in a basic pH. They need an acidic pH to absorb. So you can put the data there that shows that, and there is data to show that. Um, and then having lower levels, so if it's not absorbing well, the levels will be lower, Having lower levels reduces the amount of complete remissions able to be obtained. So if A plus B plus C does, does use of a PPI while the patient is taking one of these drugs, decrease their rate of CR attainment. So lay it out very logically. Show them the data that brings you to ask that question. Does that make sense? Okay. So I keep mentioning de-identify, de-identify. What are the identifiers? Um, so according to the IRB, there are 18 patient identifiers, most of them extremely logical, like you would assume. All of your um, name, social security, any number associated with a person. I don't know why you would ever have their IP address or their vehicle identification number, but those are specifically listed. Um, no numbers that are tied to a person can you have. If you record any of these, you can't be exempt. The exclusion for most of our projects is going to be this, dates relating to an individual. If you record their birth date, their admission date, their discharge date, their death date, then that is identifiable and that can't be exempt. So how do you do your project if you can't record their birth date and their death date and things? You can, but what you want to do and what they recommend that you do is have a coded system. So when you pull that patient information, I have Susie Q is patient one, Johnny B is patient two. That's kept in one document that's securely kept. Any of those identifiers must be assigned to the patient code. So if that file is seen, all you know is that patient one was born January 5th, 1960, and was admitted to the hospital on January 17th, 2016. So you have to have both pieces to identify that to a patient. That makes it extra secure. So that's what they want to see, um, that you have a code system. You can not have that code derived from the patient at all. So my name is Alex Schillingberg. My code could not be AS1. You can't have it from initials, things like that. Um, so the easiest way to do it, start at one and number chronologically as you enroll your patients. It's the easiest way to keep it. Um, you can have a randomized number table, something like that, but keep that file separate. That way, if you ever need to go back, if you missed a piece of data information when you're doing your analysis, you can, you can use that to go back, but that is an extra safety factor for them. All right, moving on to our next regulatory body. Um, and being that I work at the Cancer Center and a lot of research is associated with the Cancer Center, it's, this is a little um, extra piece for them. So the Protocol Review Monitoring Committee is something that the National Cancer Institute recommends that any research involving cancer has a specific committee that is designed to um, investigate any research that is diagnostic, therapeutic, prevention, or control of cancer. So basically, if your project has anything to do with cancer, it needs to go through a PRMC review as well. Um, this is how they define what a PRMC is. So what's the difference between these two bodies? And I tell my students this when they're writing their information to send to them, is you have to imagine you're on that committee and what is my goal? 
The goal of the IRB is to protect those subjects. That is it. They're not really looking at the scientific validity of your study or whether it competes with another study at WVU or anything like that. They're looking at the methods of your study and assessing the risks and benefits and ensuring that confidentiality is kept and that informed consent is done if it's needed. The goal of the PRMC is more on the scientific side. So they're looking at the scientific validity. Are you asking a good question? Is it a question that's been answered 10 times and published on already? Well, it probably doesn't need done. Um, they're assuring that your design is appropriate. Is your design going to answer the question you're trying to ask? They look at feasibility. If you're planning to enroll 1,500 sarcoma patients, you're not gonna get it here. We're not a sarcoma center, we see 10 a year. Um, so they look at those types of things. Um, establish relative priority to the institutional mission. Doesn't really apply for retrospective projects, but if you're doing something prospective, they want to know, do we have a large national cooperative group trial that also enrolls this particular type of patient, and then you're trying to enroll on it? That's a competing interest. The patient can only be on one of those. Um, so either you're going to pull patients away from the study they want patients on, or you're not going to enroll. And they also monitor these protocols ongoing. For accrual, make sure that they are actually accruing. If they're not accruing, they need shut down and things like that. So do I need PRMC review? Typically, if you're doing anything with cancer research, whether that be in the lab or with patients or with patients that have had cancer, then yes. For retrospective, it's not nearly as difficult. Um, you have a short form that you fill out that says who's doing it, what's the title, when do you plan to complete it, and a quick summary. And then it's just kind of added on as a line item addendum that doesn't really go through a full review. But the important part with that is that at the conclusion of your project, you need to submit a list of the patients to the data managers because they keep track of any patient that was accrued on a trial. Um, that's good for the numbers of the cancer institution. And we want all the work that you did to also benefit the people that we work with and for. It helps our cancer center attain reputability and credibility as, as a research institution. All right, so the fun part, project design. What do we need to know about project design? So I mentioned research question a couple times. So this is your clinical question that you want to ask. Um, you need to have appropriate and sufficient rationale. That's your background and justification. Your data endpoints need to support your primary objective. That sounds like an obvious thing, but sometimes it doesn't quite happen. So what I mean by that is the actual pieces that you pluck from that chart should support whether or not that question gets answered. Data points that are available in retrospective nature. So you have to think about this. You can think of great questions and ways to evaluate those great questions, but when you go in to look at the patient's chart, is that information available? Now, with EPIC, we have um, an intense amount of information available in those charts. The way that it's pulled and reported is sometimes easier than other ways. So you have to kind of have a little bit of familiarity with how that information is kept in order to know what you're going to get from it. Um, example being, one of my residents is doing a project now where he's evaluating whether a particular drug interaction increases the risk of mucositis, um, so breakdown of the mucosal lesion in patient's mouth during transplant. Well, mucositis isn't something that is kept in a retrievable field. It is typically in a provider note. So you are dependent on whether I write it down that day or whether she writes it down that day. And if she sees me and I write it and the next time she sees her and she doesn't, then you're gonna get missing data points. Um, also, you can't run a query to pull things like that from a note. So if your main endpoint is dependent on um, subjective providers writing that in a note, it's gonna be a lot more difficult of a project. You're gonna spend a lot more time digging through notes, reading and looking for things, as opposed to if my primary endpoint is pain score, that's something then that the nurses will enter into a flow sheet. You can pull that information with a report. Um, some, some places are easier to pull with reports than others, but we'll talk about that in a second. And the other thing to remember is difference in units. So if your study needs to collect urine output, how much urine output a patient has, and you're doing this study in the medical ICU, they are fabulous there about documenting urine output. They do it religiously, three times a shift. If you are getting a patient on the family medicine service who's up on the floor, they don't ever document urine output. So you're gonna have zeros for all of those data points. Um, so knowing what is documented in the units and the patients that you're looking at is really important. Um, so do a little pre-work, um, you know, pick a patient that you think might qualify for your study and just kind of browse through their chart and see what kind of things get recorded. 
talk to a practitioner that works on that unit and say, hey, do you guys routinely check for QTC interval when you have a patient on Zofran? If they say no, you're not going to be able to evaluate QTC prolongation for patients on Zofran in that unit. Things like that. Um, common occurrence versus rare. So an example with this was a project that was done on the incidence of DVTs in the pediatric unit for patients receiving Lovenox prophylaxis. It hasn't really been studied. Well, DVT incidences are fairly uncommon anyway. We're talking 1 to 2 percent. So in order to show statistical significance with whether one group has more DVTs than another group, you need like 800 patients. So it's not something that you can show a difference of in a small single center study. Um, so it's really hard to interpret that. What we ended up having with that person's project was she had about 100 patients in each group, and she had like two DVTs in one group and three DVTs in another group. Does that mean a lot? You can't really say. Um, so when something is very, very rare, it's hard to determine um, in a small single center study. All right, so a note on secondary objectives. Um, I often will see students present their primary objective. It's a really good, really clear primary objective. And then they have like 14 secondary objectives. Um, so really try to narrow the focus of your project. Your primary objective is the main reason for doing your project. If your secondary objectives will supplement that, then that's good. If you can get very similar data, similar patients, and supplement, you know, you're also going to look at this. Um, an example is I have a student that was doing a project looking at the time to antibiotic administration in the cancer center. So from documented fever to antibiotic documentation. Um, that was primary objective. Secondary objective was time from fever to the order entry. So really clarifying that. You know, how long did it take us to get the antibiotic to the patient? Well, was that from the order time or was that from where was the holdup? Was it putting the order in or was it after the order was put in? Um, so that was a clarifying sort of secondary objective. But you could go on and on and on and on and on with those things. And what you're really doing is you're watering down and diluting away from your primary objective. When you present data on this, you want to be able to say, this was the question I asked and this is the answer to it. Maybe you found something else here and there, but you don't want to have so many secondary objectives that you dilute that down. The other part is that it makes that interpretation very difficult and it decreases your power. You're not powered for any of those secondary objectives, so you can't make any claims on that. Your power calculation is always done based on your primary objective. Oh, and then there's this common concept too. So if you don't validate your primary endpoint, you can't really say you have significance of any of those secondary endpoints. Um, so you're, you're taking a big gamble. If you don't find value or significance in that first one, you did all that extra data collection to not really be able to say much and not make any definitive statements in your conclusion, just things that appear to be or suggest something. Um, and that doesn't really give you a strong paper if you're ch attempting to get it published. So surrogate endpoints. Where I work in cancer, we use surrogate endpoints a lot, um, and you probably do in different fields as well. And so what is a surrogate endpoint? It means that you are using something else to assume the real outcome that you want. Um, why do we do this? Why don't we just assess the real outcome? Well, sometimes it's easier to assess a surrogate endpoint. Um, sometimes it's cheaper, and it can be done sooner. So, for instance, um, you see a lot of cancer studies that will have progression-free survival and overall survival, and your professors will beat into your head that overall survival is what we really want. Well, why do we do and publish things with only progression-free survival? Well, in a disease like CLL, where the overall survival is 10 to 12 years, you'd have to wait 15 years for that data to get published, whereas we can see progression-free survival differences in three to four years. Um, so it allows us to get things to market sooner and then follow them up with confirmatory data. Um, but you have to use a surrogate endpoint that plausibly and strongly is associated with that clinical outcome. I can't use incidence of nausea and vomiting and assume overall survival from it. That doesn't make sense. Um, so you have to pick a good surrogate endpoint. Some examples of this. CD4 count is associated with AIDS mortality. Mortality takes a long time, but you can see recovery or drops in CD4 count very quickly, and those have been known to be associated together. Uric acid for gouty arthritis flares. This one is kind of interesting. So there was a drug that came out uh, about a 10, 12 years ago, and it's not used that often. It's Febuxostat. You may not have heard of it. It's sometimes used. Um, but it was shown to very well and statistically significantly and lower uric acid levels. 
So if you checked uric acid level in the blood and you gave this drug and you checked it again, it was much, much lower. But they had the same incidence of gouty attacks. So you checked a surrogate outcome that was supposed to affect your outcome, but it didn't. So be careful with those types of things. Um, and then this trial was actually interesting too. So arrhythmias and cardiac death, there was a study that looked at acanide and flecainide compared to placebo, and they found huge reduction in the occurrence and incidence of arrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmias, um, but they actually had an increase in cardiac death. So that's the outcome. The cardiac death is what we want to prevent. The arrhythmia is a secondary, or is a, a surrogate endpoint. All right, so defining your endpoints. You want to be very specific with defining your endpoints. Um, and you want to plan for the exact data, not the interpretation of that data. That's done when you write up your project. So an example is, I want to see the incidence of hepatotoxicity development with drug A. Okay, great. How am I going to define that? Um, what am I going to collect? What are my data points? So for your project, you want to be as detailed as possible. So you're going to say data points to be collected. I'm going to collect ALKFOS, total bilirubin, AST, ALT, and then develop whether or not there was encephalopathy. Why do I want to collect those data points? Because how am I going to define hepatotoxicity? You might define hepatotoxicity different than you define hepatotoxicity. Um, so we need to have a standardization for those types of things. So typically you go to guidelines or um, you know, governing bodies within that disease state that have defined this is what hepatotoxicity means. Um, so the National Cancer Institute has the common toxicity criteria for adverse events, and it is used widely in clinical trials as the main way to define those adverse events. And they have a grading system. So that way when you record your data, you can record whether it was a grade one, two, three, or four hepatotoxicity event. In order to grade it, you need to know ALKFOS, total billing, AST, ALT, et cetera. Um, so look into those types of things. You don't want to just say, I'm going to evaluate if they developed phytotoxicity, because it's not up to you whether to decide if an AST, ALT of 300 versus 700 is hepatotoxicity. There are definitions for that, so look those things up and define those. All right, so another example of being more specific. So determining the rate of renal toxicity incidence while on a drug called ibrutinib. So how do you define toxicity? Do you define it by the serum creatinine elevation? Do you define it by the calculated glomerular filtration rate estimation? Um, both of those could be acceptable. So in the event that there are multiple ways to do something, you pick one. You're the study investigator. You pick it. Um, I have a study where we're looking at obese versus non-obese patients. How do I define obese? You can define it by BMI or by percent of your ideal body weight. Both of those are generally acceptable, and you may see different organizations prefer one over the other. I, I picked greater than 190% of your ideal body weight. That's what I picked. Most people would go with BMI. In retrospect, maybe I should have gone with BMI, but you pick. You pick what you want, and you define it. And then when you report your data, you said, I defined obesity as blah, blah, blah. Um, but just make sure that you're very clear, because you don't want to be questioning yourself as you're going through collecting data. Um, so beyond that, if you use, let's say we use GFR, creatinine clearance, to calculate that. What equation do we use? Do we use Cockroft-Galt, or do we use one of the other available equations? If we use Cockroft-Galt, are we rounding the serum creatinine to one for the elderly, which is pretty common practice, or not? Some computer systems will automatically do that, some won't. Um, there are a couple different ways in EPIC, actually, that it shows the calculated GFR, and they don't always match, because they use different equations. Um, so where you collect it could be different. If you do round for elderly, do you round when they're over 65 or over 70? Does it matter? Typically, you just want to make sure to define those things. Um, you also want to define whether you're going to collect incidents at any particular time or is it any time throughout your study. So if I'm studying these patients and I'm looking at them the entire time that they're taking ibrutinib, if they develop renal insufficiency once and then recover, does that count the same as someone who developed renal insufficiency and kept it for four months? And how do I record that information? Let's say I'm going to record every single serum creatinine. Well, what if they have, get, what if they get admitted and they get three times a day labs? How do I handle that versus someone who comes into clinic every two weeks? Or someone who missed their labs and didn't show up? Um, those things happen. So just have a plan for how you're going to deal with missing data, how you're going to deal with extra data. Um, are you just going to count you know, one lab a week, the first lab that was drawn, or what have you. Um, and then you always want to know if you're going to com 
compare just the incidence, yes or no, did it happen, or the severity of the incidence? Are you going to grade it and show the incidence of grade one, grade two, grade three, et cetera? All right, so how do you find your target population? So again, think about it very clearly. What characteristics, what location? Are you going to do everybody in the hospital? Are you going to include pediatrics or not? Are you going to include critical care or not? Are they inpatients only or only patients in clinic? Who's your target population to answer that research question? And what are the criteria to be in your study? Um, for your inclusion, exclusion criteria, you want to have a reason for each. So there needs to be a reason. I've seen very extensive exclusion criteria before. And I would say, well, well, why are you excluding pediatrics? Is it different in pediatrics? Well, no. Are your endpoints different in pediatrics? No. Why not include them? If there's a reason, that's fine. Just put it in there. Um, if you have you know, conflicting interacting medications, if they're on phenytoin and that drastically affects the outcome of the, the outcome that you're looking for, and you want to exclude patients on phenytoin, put that in there. Um, that makes sense. And then don't become so restrictive that you bias your study. You don't want to pick the absolute wonderful perfect patient and exclude so many people that A, you don't meet your sample size, and B, you have biased your data to be only for those patients. And that happens not just with our student resident single center type of projects, that happens in real life. Um, you know, if you look at clinical trial data, large randomized clinical trials for CLL earlier um, that looked at FCR. They look at patients and the median age in those studies is typically 52 or 53 years old. The median age of diagnosis for CLL is 72. That's a big difference from the patients you are actually seeing in clinic. Um, so those patients tolerated FCR pretty well. You give it to a 72 year old and they will not tolerate it at all. Um, so you know, answer the question you want, exclude them for a particular reason, but don't become so restrictive. Determining your sample size. Use your stats, folks. If you know stats and you know how to do power calculations and sample size calculations, great. If you don't have a clue, look it up on the internet, take a class on Coursera, teach yourself, or use our resources that we have here. We have um, colleagues trained in biostats, bio in population statistics, all types of um, statistic trained people, and they can help you walk through, well, what is the question you want to ask? How can we go about determining that? Um, be prepared for missing data because that will lower your sample size and you can lose power from that. Um, and then if you have bias to your study because of your restrictions, then you're going to lose clinical applicability. All right. Keep in mind your power calculations. You want to design them to have the potential to show a significant difference. Um, otherwise, why are you doing the study? Um, the statistical difference that you are showing is the difference of the effect size. What is the effect size, a clinical meaningful difference? So if I'm looking at a drug and I want to lower your cholesterol and the drug looks at, um, I'm powered to show a difference of lowering your cholesterol by 100. That's not really going to happen. Total cholesterol is measured typically greater than 200. Nobody's going to lower their cholesterol by 100. So you're never going to meet that power. So what is clinically meaningful? Um, and that might be something you have to guess at. It might be something you have to look at previous studies and say, well, what did they determine was clinically meaningful? Well, in the original Lipitor study, they determined a reduction of 20% or 15% or whatever the number is. I don't know that study off the top of my head. But they determined something was clinically meaningful, that if I reduced their cholesterol by 25 points or 20%, that meant something. So that's kind of how you base that effect size. Um, you need to have that estimate when you go to your statistician, because they'll ask you for that in order to see, well, how small of a difference do you need to detect? If you need to be able to detect a difference of two points, you're going to need a lot more people than you are to detect a difference of something else. All right, so how do you sample? Sampling can be done multiple ways. And this gets more into the practical part of how do you get these patients. So you've decided what you want to do, and you've decided what you want to study, and your research question is great, and you know what data points you're going to collect. Where do the patients come from? How do you pick them? If you're doing a prospective study, it's a little easier. You wait for them to come in and, oh, you meet my XYZ criteria, I'll take you. But when you're going back into the mountains of data that we have, how are you going to pull them? Um, so there's a couple ways, and they may sound similar, but you may get different patients from it. So let's say that my patients are colon cancer patients taking capsidabine during 2015. That's the group I want to evaluate. That's what I've decided. So I can pull those by diagnosis. So I can say, OK, give me all colon cancer patients that were diagnosed in 2015, 
and then I'll look through and I'll see who got capsidabine and who didn't and weed them out with my inclusion exclusion criteria. You can go by time period and say, okay, give me everybody in 2015 that had a diagnosis of colon cancer. And so that doesn't mean you're just your new diagnosis. That means they may have had colon cancer for 10 years, but we saw them and they had colon cancer. So now they're in your group. Or by drug. So I can say, okay, I want everybody that had capsidabine during 2015. And then I'm going to look for colon cancer patients. Um, and so they sound like the same group, but you may get some variances based on how that data is pulled, based on whether patients follow up here long term. They may follow up with another physician. We may get referrals. We're a big institution, and so some of those data points are a little different. Um, prescription versus administration. When you're pulling things that have to do with a drug, that's really important. So if you pull drugs that are administered, means given by us, that means they were either given it in our infusion center or our hospital here, or the Chestnut Ridge Hospital, but one of our inpatient units, um, that data is easy to pull. That data, we can get you a lot of information. We can get you dose. We can get you the exact time between the doses that it was given. We can give you all the concurrent medications. If you want to go by prescription, which is often more real life applicability, it's a little bit harder to pull. You have to take into account that while we encourage all of our providers to put their prescriptions into Epic, that does not always happen. And I pick capsidabine because that is one for us that does get written on paper. So you're going to get some that slip through the cracks. Are you okay with that? It's kind of the only data that's available. The only way you're other going to do that is to go and find every patient and then go to their pharmacy and call Walgreens and see if they filled it and, and things like that. So you have to take those limitations of what data is available to you into account when you're looking at your study. Um, the other thing without patient prescriptions is you have to make some assumptions. You kind of assume that they're taking it the way that they should. If it's written twice a day, you assume that they're taking it twice a day. They may not be. Unless you specifically ask them, you won't know that. Um, so it is a little more difficult, but that is often more the group that you're trying to get a hold of. So how do you sample that? Um, typically, you have a target size population, but you may not need all of the ones in that group. So in the example before, colon cancer patients taking capsidabine in 2015, what if there's 1,200 of them, and your sample size that you need to determine is only 200. You don't want to have to work through 1,200 patients. You don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of time. If you do, that's awesome. Um, but you want to get to that sample size. So how do you pick? Here's where you've got to be real careful to avoid bias. So you can't just go through and pick the good ones or pick the ones that fit your criteria and to not take the ones that don't have enough data or things like that. Um, so there's really two ways that are most appropriate. Um, some kind of chronologic order, so you can either start in January of 2015. Most often people start with what's most recent and work back. So you take every patient that meets your inclusion criteria in order, reverse chronologic until you hit 200 and stop. And that's your group. Or you can look at that whole 1,200 and you can randomize them and take a, two, a random sample. Um, that typically you need some help with the data people to do that because you have to pull all 1,200 and then randomize them in a a truly random fashion. Um, and then I talked a little bit about inpatient, outpatient with prescriptions, but that changes the level of data that you get and where that data is located for a lot of things. Vital signs are located in different places. Um, the you know, notes are located in different places. Um, so there's some different things you have to take into account. Inpatient is a lot cleaner. The data is readily available. We can pull reports with a lot of that stuff that happens inpatient. Labs are a really good example. We can pull things off of labs. I can have someone pull a query for any abnormal hemoglobin and pull all those patients. Outpatient, you're not going to get that as clearly. The labs may report the same way if they were drawn here, but we have a lot of patients that get labs drawn the day before at their local facility. They bring them with them or fax them in, and then they're inputted into our records. So we can see them, but they won't pull with that query. So it, it makes things a little more complicated. It's great for the patients. We love offering that service to them, but you have to know the limitations of your data. All right, so running towards the end of my talk here, what are some resources available to you here to actually do some of this retrospective chart review? Um, so the ones that I'm going to hit on, we have a West Virginia Cancer Registry. It's a statewide registry. We have the WVU Medicine Strategic Analytics Group. We have the Oncology Quality Coordinators if you're working specifically in cancer, and I wasn't exactly sure what group this was, and that's where I come from, so 
a little word on those. Um, and then, of course, this is your WBCTSI research boot camp, so you have the WBCTSI resources available to you as well. And then you can do your own searches. So what is the Cancer Registry? So the Cancer Registry is funded by the West Virginia Division of Cancer Epidemiology. Um, it receives both state and federal funding so that we can keep track of things. There are so many reports out there and available, and the more you look into something, the more you know, you, data you find about car crashes and drunk driving, and there's people that have all data collected of all sorts. Well, this is ours. Um, so this one was started, and you can report from 1993 onward. Um, so it's gotten quite a large repository of information now. And it can determine the incidence rates by site, by sex, by race, by geographic location within our state. Um, and it looks at trends. You can actually access de-identified summary data, so in aggregate form, via the website cancerregistry.wv.gov. Um, so if all you need is to see what the incidence of stage two breast cancer is in West Virginia, you can find that there. If you need case information, so if you need to look further and see, okay, of those new diagnoses of breast cancer, how many of them were taking this drug? Or how many of them got a mammogram at the appropriate time? Those types of questions, you need case level data. That means individual patient data. That can be made available to you. Um, however, if you want the entire state's worth of data, you have to submit a request that has to be approved by their epidemiologist. So again, that's another approval, and it's gonna be pretty detailed. If for them to release to you case-based data, they need to know that your question is legitimate, your data storage is appropriate, et cetera. Um, if you only want our site, so that's our, these are our patients, we have access to our data. Um, you can go see our data manager, um, and she can give you that information, because you're one of ours. Um, you still need IRB approval if you're gonna report that data out, but that information is a little easier to get. Of course, if you wanna go through the Cancer Registry epidemiologist, you can get the entire state, so your study's a little bit stronger, a little more robust, you've got a lot more to work with there. Um, so, some pluses and minuses, but Pam Motes, and that's her email address, um, she is, and I believe you have all these slides and you can post them later for them, so you'll have all this contact information. Um, but Pam is, her job is our, our Cancer Registry data manager. That's what she does. Um, so if you need our patients, she can help you out with that. All right, so WVU Medicine, our big giant hospital, Strategic Analytics. We have an entire department named Strategic Analytics. Um, sounds like a really cool name. Kind of wish I was in that department. Um, so the, the purpose of this department is financial planning and continuous improvement for cost reductions and savings. So keep in mind that when you're using this department. That's their goal, is to plan for the institution. So they have mountains of data and can pull very extensive reports. Um, but when you're talking to these people, you have to remember um, that while they have very important clinical data elements, they're not clinicians. They were computer engineers, computer science majors. They are excellent at data management and can do all sorts of reports that I can't even fathom how to make. But they don't understand why you need a serum creatinine for someone who has on dialysis. Those types of things. It doesn't, they don't logically go through the process you go through. So be very clear in what you're looking for and how you wanna pull it. Um, and you'll get really good results, um, but don't expect to be able to say, oh, I'm looking at this and I need to find this. It just, that's a different level of training. Um, you can get a ton, a ton of detail. They can pull all sorts of things for you. I had her pull a report. I wanted to see um, patients that I have in the stem cell transplant unit are on a drug called Bactrim prophylactically, very low dose to prevent PCP pneumonia. I have a lot of UTI development. Bactrim is our standard first-line treatment for UTIs here. So I wanted to see how many of these patients that had been exposed to a low level of Bactrim had a resistant organism in their UTI that ended up being treated with Bactrim. Um, so she was able to pull for me all patients that were seen in the cancer center that had a positive culture from a urine sample and were taking Bactrim. So I got a really nice list of patients that I already knew they had a urine culture drawn that resulted with some bacteria and they had a, a prescription for this low dose Bactrim. So I could weed through then and find out my exact group. So I looked over five years of data. She sent me a list of about 50 or 60 patients. By the time I weeded through the exact group I needed, I had about 28. So out of five or six years, the 28 patients I needed to look at were given to me. So it's, it's very helpful. Um, Kim Evans is their lead analyst, so she's probably your contact. Um, depending on time of year, they get pretty busy, um, so you may or may not get an instant reply. They have a couple decision support analysts there. She's at the head of that, but they're all located under the strategic analytic group. 
You do need IRB approval before they will give you your data. They're not going to just pull all kinds of reports because you're curious about questions. Um, you need to have an IRB approval when you go to them. Um, and then again, remember, they're not clinical or oncology trained. These are mathematicians, engineers, computer science folks, and they have their own specialties and expertise, um, but we're speaking different languages. So sometimes I don't understand what she's telling me when she's doing certain box parallelogram analyses, and she doesn't understand what I mean when I say I want low-dose spectrum. Um, may take several emails. It may be helpful to set up a face-to-face -face so you can tell them what you're looking for and get those questions instead of through 12 emails, just in a quick 10-minute face-to-face. Um, and also keep in mind, there are five or six analysts for the entire health system, not just our hospital, the entire statewide health system. Um, so they get very busy. Just keep that in mind. Another resource, if you're into um, cancer research and oncology projects, are our oncology quality coordinators. Um, that is their job title, so they have lots of information for us. Um, they aggregate data for our patients, and the purpose is for a lot of the accreditations that we do. So fact accreditation is required to have a stem cell transplant program. Um, ACOS is the College of, um, College of Surgeons. Um, different organizations require a lot of reporting. So they have a lot of detail. Um, transplant data we have from pre-transplant until the patient expires, and we have data from how bad their DHD was, when did they develop it, how many times did they get this, that, or the other side effect, all in a spreadsheet for you. Um, so if you're interested in either breast cancer or transplant and heme, those will be your contacts for those. No, I realize that's a little more subset type of patients. And then, of course, you have your Clinical Trials and Translational Science Institute, which is this group. Um, Biostatistics support, clinical data resources, um, different funding mechanisms that you can apply for grants, and community networks of other researchers. Um, and they also have this very helpful integrated data repository, or IDR, which is a statewide repository of de-identified clinical information that you can access for different sorts of projects. Um, they have tissue banking samples that are now available, and then I pulled this straight from their website. They now have over 2 million unique patients um, and streamlined the access and the application process to get permission. Um, so that is available to you as well. In the last few minutes, I'll talk about doing your own reports, and I, I think this is helpful, especially as like an initial search to feel out what kind of information you're going to find in the chart, where you're going to find it, are you going to be able to get what you need. But be careful. Know what you're looking at. Um, it's easy to falsely assume things that you've gotten all the patients that you need and you really have gotten a tenth of the patients that you should have. Um, so unless data queries are your specialty, and even though you may be really good at it, you may not even have the privileges in that system to do that. When I log in, Epic knows I'm a pharmacist. It knows I'm not a data person. There are pieces of information I cannot access because of my login credentials. Um, so just keep in mind, you know, make sure you know that what you've got is what you think you've got. Um, it's not easy to do this. Reporting in EPIC can be very difficult. Um, some common tools you can use are the EPIC Reporting Workbench, EPIC Clarity, and then the Reporting Workbench Extract Templates. Um, also, you can manually search and find patients. Um, this is not recommended. It is a high risk of bias. Um, and it's also extensive work for you. So unless you have a really small, well-defined population that you know exactly they're only dialysis patients, I work really close to the dialysis unit, I know exactly how to pull them, beyond that, I would discourage doing that. So what is the EPIC reporting workbench? So there's a menu item in EPIC titled My Reports. If you click on My Reports, you'll see three elements. My Reports, Recent Results, and Library. This is a log or a, an access to reports that are already built. These reports exist. Other people had them built. You can have access to them. You can have reports specifically built for you. You can star reports that you run frequently. These are real-time reports. They're operational type reports. That's what they were designed for is to help clinicians to practice. So keep in mind that you can't pull large amounts of data. Um, you can't pull you know, a year-to-date summary. I can't pull all of those patients from 2015 with colon cancer taking capsidabine. You will crash the system and it will basically tell you, no, you can't get back. It just has this little wheel that just spins for hours and hours and hours and it never works. Um, but the good thing is if you have smaller groups of data, if I want to look at the last two weeks and I want to do it every two weeks and look at the last two weeks, from that report I can link directly to the chart. 
So rather than having a report with an MRN and then going and logging in and pulling it up and pulling up the MRN and trying to find a chart, you look at your report and you say patient A and you click on it and their chart opens. Um, so that's really helpful when you're trying to streamline and work through things quickly. Um, most chart review projects, however, the, the lump of data is too large. The servers that run this are the servers that also run the day-to-day -day operations of Epic, so the doctor's treating patients right now, um, and so it strains those servers. But this is how you do it. So within Epic, there is um, a function called reports. So if you do the Epic drop-down menu, you can find reports. You click on it, and you get reports and library. Library is all of the other ones. These are some of my favorites um, that I have used and that I run pretty frequently. So if I click on, which one did I run? Oral chemo. So if I click on WVRX outpatient chemo orders report, this report was designed and set up to run any prescription written for an oral chemo agent, and there's a classification that's a flag on the medication that's, that's anti-cancer or not. Um, so I can tell, is, there, is that flag there or not? Meaning, is it a cancer drug or not? So I'm only pulling those, and it's the last seven days. So from the time I run it, it's that point, and then seven days previous. Um, so I can see here, I can see the age of the order. This order was written one minute before I ran the report. So it was literally written in clinic as I was sitting there. I can see what the drug was, who wrote it, and what the order date was. And so in this report goes back seven days. They can't really do too much more than that. Um, but for me, working in the clinic and I need to do oral chemo counseling, I can run that report twice a week and I can scroll through and see and just kind of eyeball, did I get to all of those patients? Um, so that's, why, that's what I mean by operational. So Epic Clarity is more often used for things that are chart review size reports. Um, it's, a, it's called a relational database. It's, it's run by Oracle and um, my ex-husband was a computer software engineer, so I know some of these terms, but I'm not exactly sure that I'm using them correctly. Um, but they are software experts. There are people that are actually certified Oracle experts, which sounds like something really cool from the matrix. It's not, it's just software engineering. Um, but Oracle or Microsoft SQL are two of the servers that they use. They have its own server. So the Oracle or the server runs separate from the day-to-day -day operations of the servers that run Epic for the physicians and patients there right now. Um, so it's able to query 10 years of data and not drain those servers and not slow everything down. So it can work pretty quickly. Um, typically it's housed off-site. These are analytic reports, meaning they're not real time. You can't get things the day of. And so that's why they're not operational. Um, you can get them one day old though. So when you run a report from Clarity, it's you know, January 1st, 2017 to whatever yesterday's date was, January 26th. I can't get data from today. And the reason is there's, um, there's a safety mechanism on all of our data that, I forgot the name of what it's called, but at the end of the night, at midnight, the, all of the data downloads into this system. And so real-time data, we're using this, it's active now. Um, Kara puts in a blood pressure, now I can see it immediately wherever I'm at in the hospital. Um, so that's very helpful. But for the reporting data, you can't constantly be loading that into the system. It just doesn't function that way. So at a point when things are slow, typically around midnight, it all downloads into the server and is available for aggregating the data. There's no restriction on the amount of data. You can have 30,000 data points returned to you. And if you're not careful with how you write your report, you could get 30,000 data points. Um, and you can submit a request for these to be created. You do not have the ability, unless you work for Epic Clarity Department in our hospital, to run these report or to make these reports. Once they make it for you, you can run that report as many times as you want, but you can't create a report. You have to submit a request. So how does one do that? I can show you. Um, so if you go to your little um, home screen, your little tabby thing over there, everybody's looks a little bit different. Um, but typically there is a clarity report request somewhere. I've looked at doctors, nurses, fellows, and mine, and they all look a little bit different on your home screen based on how you customize it. Um, but there's either this BI portal, which links to clarity reports, or I have it under my useful links. I have epic clarity report request form. Um, so it's in there somewhere. You may have to go to like the customize and then look for search type of things, but you're looking for Epic Clarity. If you cannot find it, call the help desk and say you want to get Epic Clarity reporting to your home screen. They can help you find that link. Um, I use it frequently enough that I kind of have it on my favorites. So once you click on that right there, 
you will get this page. So you get a general report request. And so I can say, do I want to change my existing report? I have a Tacrolimus report, but it looks at, you know, the last seven days. I really need it to look at the last two weeks. Or I need it to also look at this. Or do I need a whole new report? I decided that I need to look at X, Y, Z. Um, so from there, it'll have several forms for you to fill out. It'll ask you what you're looking for, um, what data points you need, what time frame you need it in, um, how the patients are pulled, and then what do you want from it. So I want every patient that has had a tacrolimus level result. But I also want, when you give me that report, I want their name, I want their MRN, I want the date of the encounter that the lab was drawn, and I want the level, I want the actual result. Um, so you have a couple pieces to fill out. Um, you may get a little back and forth once that request gets to where it needs to go. Then they'll tell you, okay, the report's live, test it, see if it's what you want. Um, and so that, it does take some time. I think it takes, depending on their workload, I've had it take up to three weeks to build a report. So it's not something like you do on a whim all the time. It's like, this is something I'm going to use consistently and I need it built. Um, if you need like a one-time query, um, you know, probably best to go to data analytics. But if it's something you're going to run routinely, you can have a report built. The Epic Reporting Workbench Extract Templates. Again, this has to be built for you by IT. You can't build it. Um, but it allows you to transmit these files to another system, um, and it can be run automatically in a batch. An example of this, I've only had one of these done. I know this process is a little fuzzy for me. Um, but I have a monthly chemo template report. So, to order chemotherapy, you have to put it from a template into a system called Beacon. And I want to know every month, I want a list of all of them. And so I don't think I have a picture of it because it has a lot of patient information on it. Um, but every first of the month, so February 1st rolls around, I wake up and I have an email in my inbox at 2 a.m. every month that has a, an attachment that has every plan that was entered in Beacon for the last month. Um, and that's helpful for me because I want to see Who's writing our orders? Are the physicians writing them all? Are the pharmacists writing them all? Are the nurses writing them all? Um, what orders are being put in? Are we putting in a ton of one particular type? I started it because we had some very, very expensive drugs that we don't keep on the shelf, and I wanted to know if I was missing some of those to make sure that we were ordering them. Um, but it's actually useful for a lot of things. So you can have that built, and you can have it batch those jobs and say, every month I want to see how much this. Um, so those are some options that you have. But in summary, um, a couple points, have other people look at your project. You will get all kinds of ideas. You don't have to take all of those ideas, um, but consider them. You know, consider their point of view. Oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. I never thought about patients that might not have blah. Um, so have other people look at it. Be very specific, as specific as you can regarding your data points. Um, allow the time needed for necessary approvals. IRB meets every other week. Um, so if you submit it, you could be waiting up to two weeks before they even look at it, and it depends on whose agenda it goes on. Um, understand the ways that the patient charts can be identified and how you can pull that information. Determine the best way to pull your initial patient list before you start doing your inclusion exclusion. Use the resources available to you here. We have a lot of resources to help you before you start your project to plan it out, to run those, those statistics for calculations, power calculations. We have a lot of support on the back end to help you when you actually have data and how to analyze that. And then my one caveat is pick a topic you're interested in because you are going to be married to this topic from start to finish and you are going to be so tired of looking at it and talking about it and reading your background over and over and adding more references to it. Pick something that you have a legitimate or a semi-legitimate interest in um, and you will do a better project, you will have better outcomes um, and you won't hate it as much going through it. So this is my contact information. Um, I'm from the pharmacy department in the Cancer Center. If anyone has any questions, I don't have much time. I'd be happy to answer them outside, though. Thank you for coming. <laughs>